June and I have had a good week, a very busy week. We, we left, uh, well, I had a few more things to throw in a suitcase. But we left uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday afternoon, headed to, to Minnesota. We had a, a week's full of uh, ministers' meetings, and, uh, you know, we, uh, you know, just a, a time for ministers to get together, encourage one another. We also raise a significant portion of the money uh, for the prisons that we support there in Kenya. And, uh, you know, we started out, uh, you know, working with AFCM, which is our organization, and Disciples of Mercy. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to be very quickly up to uh, about 53 prisons. We've got permits for another 37. <clears throat> but it's a tremendous, you know, it's just a tremendous outreach. You know, one, we're, again, they tell us this is the government. The government tells us it is the most significant plan they've ever had for rehabilitating uh, their, uh, their inmates. Uh, there was one prison, you know, you know, they get different sized prisons. There's one prison that only had 19 students and 15 of them were some of their officers. So now they're encouraging their officers to, to participate in that. We're also putting to get, together a, a program for their officers to help them with challenges in their lives. There's, there's many reasons for that, that they have other difficulties. Many times when you begin to work for the prison system there, what they do to maintain security is that they move these men and women regularly. So uh, uh, Kenya covers 225,000 square miles, and your family may live in the north, and they may have you stationed in the south, and you could see where that would cause difficulties for families. So we're, we're going to be developing a program, and that's going to give us access to minister to another 25,000 people that work within that system. Then every time we do a graduation, they invite their families in, and we'll have crowds of anywhere from 150 additional, you know, on top of the prison population, we'll have crowds of anywhere from 150 to 400 additional people come in for that graduation. And, you know, in, in, in any given year, we see 12, 15, 1,800 people get saved every year just as a result of those graduations when we give an invitation. So we're helping them. It helps us to be able to fulfill the Great Commission, which is a tremendous door of opportunity. And again, we've had a very busy week, very full week, but we're always thrilled to be able to come home. Um, you know, we take two days going up. We only take one day coming home. Uh, when I'm pointed toward the house, I'm, I'm, I'm coming in. And uh, so anyway, it's, it's, uh, we know our youth had a great week at camp. We're, we're excited about that. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have a baptism here in just a couple of weeks, and uh, real grateful, real grateful for all those. Would you give a hand to all those who took off their time? Thank you. Uh, Ray's not with us. Uh, of course, you know we have a great team out there. You know, uh, you know Ray's a youth minister, but that's a great team out there that helps work with those youth. You can't take forty nine kids somewhere and not just have a great team. And, uh, and so that them taking off their time, sacrificing, I started to say raise at home, not feeling well, uh, but we're, we're praying and believing that you're going to have a, a quick and speedy recovery. And uh, again, great week. Uh, thankful, for, uh, thankful for a very supportive church. And I want to encourage you now that we are going to have a fireworks sale. You do everything you can to help us promote it. You know, go through your friend list, send them. A, really, I'd like for you to go through your friends list, send them an invitation. The overwhelming majority of them are going to buy fireworks somewhere. Uh, they just will buy them here. And uh, uh, that's a lot of kids. We've already, we've already put up a tremendous amount of money to, 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 to see to it that they've got to go to camp. And this is their main fundraiser. Thank you all you who got your cars, cars washed. That was tremendous. Uh, you gave nice gifts, and we're just, we're just grateful. So anyway, let's turn to the Word. Can you say amen? amen. Man, I, 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 like, I like what uh, uh, Peter said. Uh, you know, that Jesus posed this question. He said, who do men say that I am? And some say that thou art Elias, and others say Jeremiah. And Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ. Son of the living God. You know, we, we don't have a dead message. We get a living message. For the Word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's alive. It's not that just that God spoke, but God is still speaking through His Word to us. Can you say amen? We've been talking about growing spiritually. 
And two weeks ago, I, in the middle of this, I, uh, I stopped and, and spoke last week on fatherhood. I, gosh, I like to talk about fatherhood. But we started the message, and we were going to talk about the two bookends of the fruit of the Spirit. So uh, I'm going to pray and start. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word, to teach and to preach your gospel. Thank you, Father, that your word's good seed, and it's sown on good ground. That it'll produce good fruit. And we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> We're going to begin in Galatians, the fifth chapter. Again, I tell those who are listening online, we always appreciate your listening. Uh, it's always good if you'll like it, if you share it, if you'll comment on it. Uh, we, we really appreciate your help. You know that uh, I, we never go very many weeks where I'm not contacted by somebody uh, who gave their heart to the Lord. And so, uh, and listen, I, you know, I pretty, I've got confidence in the things that we're trying to share. It, it just be a help. You know, I, uh, I try to provide salvation in every invitation, but in the messages, I'm speaking to people of faith. You know, how, how do we walk? How do we live? What are practical? And when I say practical, that doesn't mean non-spiritual things that would help us in our lives. Every day, every week. What are the things that help us to grow? So we're looking at Galatians, the fifth chapter. Again, we've been talking about growing spiritually. It says in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the New King James Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. I kind of like that. and I, I could almost stop there because I do believe that's what the fruit of the Spirit is. The rest of this helps describe what that love is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I've underlined love and self-control. We did spend some time talking about love and, and how that sacrificial love and how love was not a mystery. Love is something that you can understand. Love is something you should be rooted and grounded in. Love is something that we should be growing in on a continual basis. This fruit of the Spirit, if you will, it is that which when you re read the preceding verse and talks about the work of the flesh, this is how you overcome the flesh. And we all deal with the flesh. So we're going to today pick up with self-control. You know, if I look at those uh, again, and if I go to the end and talk about self-control, I will not replace saying that, you know, it begins with love. But it ends with self-control, and if you will, self-control is an aid to every one of those attributes. These, the, this, is, this is not the fruit of your heart, your spirit. This is a fruit of the Spirit of God. And fruit is something that grows in our lives. You know, when you first get born again, you don't have all the love you need. You've got the potential for all the love you need. You don't have all the joy you need, but you have the potential for it. You can grow in it. We should be like Jesus. Grow in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So when we're talking about these things, we're again, picking up with self-control, it is an aid and an asset to the other eight fruit. See, self-control is this. Self-control is, if you will, is showing love even when it's hard. Self-control is seeking joy in difficult times. Self-control is pursuing peace right in the middle of hardship. Self-control is, is choosing patience when you don't want to wait. Self-control is kind when it would be easier to fight back. Self-control to, is, to, is good when you, when you want to go against the goodness of God. Self-control helps us to stay faithful even when one wants to give up. And self-control is gentle when it would be much easier to be harsh. Proverbs 16.32, the, the New Living Translation, I, I like the way that it reads. It says, better to be patient than powerful. Say that with me. I think that's a great statement, don't you? Say this with me. Better to be patient than to be powerful. Great statement. 
Let's read the latter half. Better to have self-control than conquer a city. Proverbs is telling us this. It's a greater achievement to have self-control to bring your passions and desires underneath God's governance, to have that self-control working in your life. It's greater than a great conquest that other people would applaud. It's better to have self-control than it is to be called a hero. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. We can all readily see, if we just look at the culture in which we live in, and, the, and many times the foolish mistakes, and sometimes people do just make mistakes. Sometimes people are habitually sinning. But we, we make mistakes. We fail. I'm not saying that's not sin, but we don't start out to do it. You know, the Bible talks about practicing sin. And if there was a greater degree of self-control in one's life, how that many times we would not fall into those traps. See, God's, God's original plan for mankind was this, was self-control. It says in Genesis 2, 15 and 17, the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded man, and he says this, you're free. Everybody say, you're free. All right, you've got some responsibility here. You're free to eat from any tree in the garden. You must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat it, you will what? So we've got all these other trees. We don't know how many trees. We do know the tree of life was in the midst of the garden. The very best I can tell that they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and didn't eat of the tree of life. All the other guard, all the other trees they could have partaken of. But you know, the Adam and or Eve were standing there at the tree and they said, Wow, it looks good. It looks good for food. I, it, I, it looks like it's desirous to make one wise. And so they do this thing that God forbade them to do. And their absence of self-control. And they partake of the tree that God forbid them to partake of. It was a part of God's original plan. Self-control is this. Self-control is strength, power, or mastery over oneself. You know, you know we're... We're, we're, we're the biggest battle we got. Yeah. I know there's a tempter. I, I, I get that. He, he, he was involved there. Uh, but there is no such thing as the devil made me do it. There's no such thing. The absence of self-control is having no strength to resist temptation. Throughout God's Word, it teaches this. It teaches self-control. Proverbs 25, 28 reads this way. A person without self-control is with, like a house with its doors and windows knocked out. When we don't have self-control in our lives, what does it do? It leaves us vulnerable. Who's going to keep the robber from coming in? What's going to keep the elements from getting through? There's what? There's just no safety. A person without self-control is like a house with its doors and windows knocked out. Now, none of us, you know, and, you know unless we just had to do something very short term, and even then we would do something to try to cover the windows and doors, but none of us would live in a home without doors and windows. I mean, you can fix a hole in the wall, but you've got to have doors and windows. Without it, there's absolutely no security. There's no significant line 
of defense. Listen to this. Self-control does this. Self-control protects us from excess. And it provides. Listen, everything God tells you is both for protection and provision. Everything. So it protects us from excess, and it provides for enjoyment. Self-control, if you will, protects us from contempt, but it provides for respect. Self-control protects us from embarrassment and provides for self-esteem. Self-control, it'll protect us from rage, and it will provide for us restraint. Restraint. We could certainly see that restraint is a necessary thing in people's lives. You know, Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no revelation, the people perish. I like the Amplified Bible. It says this. I, I, I shared about vision while I was gone this week, and so I'm, you know, the thought is fresh on my mind. It says where there is no, first of all, the Amplified says vision, and then in parentheses, redemptive revelation of God. See, everything God teaches us is redemptive. Self, having, having an understanding of self-control would be a redemptive revelation. And so the Amplified says, if, you know, where there is no redemptive revelation of God, the people go without restraint. You want to fill these two in. Much of sin is this, is an unchecked appetite. Much of sin is an unchecked appetite. You know, we all have appetites, desires. Many times it's, it's even too much of a thing that's not necessarily bad. And much of character is self-control. Much of character is self-control. You know, it's easy, always easy to pick on anger. <laughs> it just is. You know, it's an easy target. And, and listen, and, and for most of us, it's pretty relatable. I, I get it, you know. I'm, uh, uh, I've been subject to a short fuse. But you know, that is a matter of self-control. It's a matter of self-control. And when, we, and when we, we talk about anger, which is one of the works of the flesh, we'd say, well, I can't help it. My dad had a bad temper. I can't help it. I'm redheaded. You've heard it, haven't you? Yeah. Oh, my fiery redhead, you know. I, you, we, let's don't curse anybody. Hello. Listen, I can't help it because I'm Irish. And I can't help it because I have Indian in me. But I was raised Italian, and you know what, Ed? They couldn't help it because they were Italian. I'm yet to meet the ethnicity that doesn't have a problem with anger because it's not a racial problem. It is a flesh problem. Much of sin is an unchecked appetite. And much of character is self-control. Timothy says this, he's speaking to the day which we live in. Where are we at in that? I don't know absolutely, but I, I, I do believe it is this day. But know this in the last days, and that's what I believe, last days. Perilous times will come. Well, listen, if these aren't perilous, I don't know when they will. Last days, perilous times will come. Listen to these things. Men will be lovers of themselves. It's both selfish and perverted. Lovers of money. Boasters, proud, blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. How anti-fruit of the Spirit could you get? Who's he writing to? Church. That's who he's warning. But he's talking about what will be in the world, but he's warning the church. Unloving. Unforgiving. Slanderers. And he finishes 
without self-control. One of the signs of the age. Without self-control. One of the fruit of the Spirit. Again, the fruit of the Spirit, you know, you, this is, these are the things that mature you. We're talking about spiritual growth. I've often shared that 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, that uh, the twelfth chapter talks about the nine fruit of the Spirit, or not the nine gifts of the Spirit. So there's nine gifts, but gifts don't have anything to do with maturity. The Bible teaches us those are distributed, and I believe in the gifts. I believe in all nine of them. Forget that apostolic age came and, came and went. There's nothing in the Bible that says that. People make stuff up. And then people believe what they make up. And then they repeat it to other people. You know? And, and I won't say anything sarcastic. I'll leave it at that. There are nine gifts. I believe there is an absence of gifts because there is an absence of fruit. When he gets through talking about the gifts, what's it say? Now the greatest of these is love. Oh. This, is where the, this is where the character is. This is where the spiritual maturity is. These are the things that grow you. Grow us spiritually. Makes us more Christ-like. Created in the image of God and after the likeness of God. When we grow in these areas, people see more Christ within us. We become that living epistle seen and read of all men. He said in the last days, there'll be those with what? Without self-control. I return to Proverbs 25, 28, and it says, He who has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. It's, what, it's a defenseless city. They have no way to defend themselves. No way to keep out the enemy. No way to keep out thieves. They have no line of protection. Again, when we do not have self-control in our lives, what we don't have is no defense for character. Without self-control, you could, you could easily understand this and me not even have to expound upon it. There's no defense for marriage. Somebody say amen. Without self-control, there's no defense for reputation or testimony. And without self-control, there is no defense from society. Again, we are left what? We are left vulnerable. It may be the last of the nine fruit, but it's not the least of the nine fruit of the Spirit. Again, I believe it is an aid to the other eight. Vincent word studies, excellent word study. I can't tell you how many times I've dug gold out of Vincent's word studies. Self-control, holding in hand the passions and desires. Holding in hand the passions and desires. See, far too many times it is passion and desire that is driving us when what we need is something to restrain us. Remember when Jesus comes to the disciples in the garden? And he says to them, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What that really means, it's the flesh that's controlling them. Jesus calls that a weakness of character. That's what he means by weakness. That is a weakness of character. <clears throat> Unable to hold in hand passions and desires. Do they want to do right? Absolutely, they want to do right. Why self-control? So difficult to master. 
Or here's what I believe. Self-control is not just a discipline of the mind. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. And until it becomes that in your life and my life, it will not grow. It's not just a discipline of the mind. And I, I don't want to trivialize that. But that's not what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's a discipline of the mind. It doesn't say anything about the mind in that verse. Self-control. Perseverance. Some translations say constinence, which means to abstain from, to refrain from. And if you would dig into the Greek, it means especially debauchery and immorality. You could see where self-control is a deal. It's what? It's a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Just like love. The Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by what the Holy Spirit. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is the product of being born again. It is the, it is the inward man growing and developing. It's a part of you that will never pass away. Self-control is what? It's a work of the third person of the Trinity living in our lives, helping us, enabling us, empowering us. I often see this is why it's so important to have a recognition of the third person of the Trinity at work in your life. I advocate a spirit-filled life. Here's what control is. We've seen this, and from time to time we probably fall prey to it. Control is when you impose, when we impose our will on others. Somebody say amen. Self-control is when we allow God to impose His will on us. Yeah. When we let the Father what to speak to us, direct us, correct us, change us, transform us. That is what self-control. This is not just a strong discipline of mind. And listen, and I again, I, I, I'm grateful for that. That's a good thing. You know, I, you know, I get I get bit by a spider. I'm telling you, the first two two, two days, that itch like the worst mosquito bite you ever had in your life. But I kept saying to myself, Bill, don't scratch that. So that was a discipline of the mind. Okay, and that, and that's fine. But what I really need is something deeper than that. I need for God to be able to impose His will upon me. I must be willing to surrender to that, submit to that, yield to that. John says, I've, I must decrease so he can what? Anytime we decrease, he increases. Anytime we can get out of the way, he increases. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, we begin to read about the fruit of the Spirit once again. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the work which His presence within your life accomplishes. I really like that. So it's telling me something about what's happening. Is love, joy, or gladness, peace, patience, or an even temper, forbearance, kindness, goodness, or benevolence, faithfulness, Gentleness, uh, which is meekness and humility. Self-control. Self-restraint. Continence. Against such there is, there is no law. that can bring a charge. You want to walk upright before God. You want to walk innocent before God. You develop the fruit in your life, and the Bible says uh, against which this, the law will what bring no charge. Those who belong to Christ Jesus the Messiah have crucified the flesh, that is the godless human nature, with its passions, appetites, and desires. 
I see that's real life. That is what everybody deals with, is its passions, appetites, and desire. You know, Paul said, I, he went through struggle. He said, I want to do good, and that I do not do. Why? He's got these passions, appetite, and desires. But here he's telling us what to do. We've got to what? Well, we've, we've got to nurture, develop. Give attention to fruit rather than give attention to the works of the flesh. It'll help us to undercome that, the godless and human nature. One might ask, well, how do we crucify the flesh? Well, here's how. You crucify the flesh by com coming under the Holy Spirit's influence and control. See, if we're not careful, we'll be deceived when we see the word self-control because we would be imposing all of that upon ourselves. But we already know that th that's not true with love because it is the love of God. It's agape. It's a God kind of love that we're talking about. It's sacrificial love. It's loving them who hate you. You get that. My, that takes what? It takes a God kind of love. I've told it numerous times. Years ago, I had a friend of a church was having a 25th uh, anniversary, and they, they asked me to come speak. And so I've got a message, haven't preached it in years, about lifting your lid. You know, and, uh, you know Saul has killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. Right? Peter, should I forgive seven times? No, Jesus said, lift your lid. Forgive 70 times seven. So I'm preaching this message, you know, and, and talking about lifting your lid, you know, you know, allowing growth into your life and, and you know, to, to be able to do more than you thought you could do, to achieve more than you thought you could achieve, to find yourself in the will and plan of God. And so I get to the end of the service and, and you know, and, and you know, it, was, it was a good service. First of all, it's their 25th anniversary. They're all excited. They got guests there. You know, I'm preaching. I'm swatting flies and spitting cotton. You know, and uh, it's happening. And so anyway, that uh, I get to the end of the message, and I said, Sister, what are you going to do to lift the lid in your life? And she stands up and she says, Well, I'm, you know, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to forgive somebody who hurt me. And it went to someone else, and I said, what are you going to do? And he, that guy said, I'm going to give a gift I never gave before. And so we did that five or six times. And I said, anyone else? And then in the very back of a room, a woman stands up. And I said, ma'am, what are you going to do to lift your lid? Oh, you talk about a humbling moment for me. She stands up. She says, nobody here knows me. She said, I saw you were having service, and I... I just felt compelled to come in. You know, it's called the Holy Spirit. I felt compelled to come in. She says, I've come, I've sat through the service, I've, uh, I've, I've enjoyed it, but I've also found it challenging. She says, again, nobody knows me, you wouldn't know this, but she said, seven years ago, my daughter was murdered. She says, I'm going to lift my lid. I'm going to the penitentiary to meet that man and forgive him. And see, we're talking about something that's what? God. God. Self-discipline wouldn't create that. That's extraordinary. That is supernatural. That's God working in our life. Well, you know, in the end, as difficult as that was for her, she'll in the end have a burden lifted from herself. She was crucifying the flesh. You could understand that woman wanting revenge. I could understand her wanting to pull the trigger, you know, or the, or, 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 or the electricity. I, you understand? I, that's not a far-fetched thought for me. To want to understand it, to want to, to justify her? No. Something bigger happened in her life. She wasn't going to have to carry that burden the rest of her life. You know, God isn't just setting us free. What we call self-control, if we're not careful, we, we, we think that is about, it is not a, 
It's about us. It's not about us. It's for us. It's for us. You might just call that spirit control. Again, that's God. What? Him imposing his will upon our lives. I mean, as great as what she did, that is not exactly. That's not, that's not even. Again, there's a similarity between what she forgave and what God did for us, but only a similarity. And the father sends his son. And in the garden, the son's got to make a decision. This is a great time to say this. So many times people pray, if it be thy will. Right? There's only one time in the Bible to pray, if it be thy will, and that is about the future. I believe, I believe it's Peter. Peter said, don't, don't say that we will go to this city next year, we will go to this city or that city and buy and sell and trade. Let's say if it's the Lord's will. So when you're talking about the future, that belongs to him. But otherwise, you should find the will of God in prayer, in the Word. So if I'm praying for somebody to get saved, I already know what the will of God. He's not willing that any perish, but all have everlasting life. So just praying, Lord, thy will be done, you've missed it. What Jesus is doing here in the garden it, he's making a commitment. That would be the other time. I apologize. There's two times to pray it concerning the future and making a commitment. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Now, was he confused about the will of God? Oh, he knew exactly what the will of God is. Sometimes God wants you to do things that you would not really want to do. That's what? Ah, now we're talking about what self control is. Because we're coming under what? We're coming under, he's imposing his will upon us and we're submitting to it. Self-control is to be controlled by the Spirit of God. It's his being the influence in our lives. Galatians, once again, 5.25. If we live by the Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Holy Spirit. Again, when we get born again, the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of our lives. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Romans, His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When we get born again, he, the Spirit of God comes to live in our lives. So that is where life comes from. We live by the Holy Spirit. Let us also what? Walk. So you can be alive in God but not walking with Him. Let us also walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. Pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty clear. Our conduct controlled by the Spirit. Again, I want to encourage you, not enough time to preach everything in one message you'd like to say. It is having an awareness in our lives that He's there. I mean, it's listening when He checks you about saying something before you say it. About responding in a way that you might not ought to respond. Sometimes it's doing a, a good gesture that you wouldn't normally do. Just real briefly, we'll close with this. The prize comes to those who exercise self-control. The prize comes to those who exercise self-control. Many won't know who this is, and many will know who it is. Tom Landry. Tom Landry was a legendary coach for the Dallas Cowboys. Tom Landry was a good Christian man, too. Won some Super Bowls. He's a Hall of Fame coach. And Tom Lambert said this, the job of a coach is to make men do what they don't want to do in order to achieve what they've always wanted to be. 
Therein lies the strength of having the Holy Spirit help us with self-control. To help us to do things we might not otherwise do, but so that we can achieve the Christ-likeness in our lives that we would like to achieve. I will close 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 24 and 20, 25. Now, Paul has numerous analogies concerning sports. Sports was a significant part of the Greek culture. And he uses it numerous times. And he says, you know all that in a race, all the runners run. But only one gets the prize. So run to win. Those who compete in the games use self control so that they can win a crown. That crown is an earthly thing that lasts for only a short time. It was just a nice wreath that they made, placed it upon their head in just a few days. It's withered and brittle. That crown is an earthly thing that lasts only a short time. But our crown will never be destroyed. There is a crown for those who understands these two bookends of the fruit of the Spirit. Everything in between there is important too. Knowing how important and valuable love is. And then exercising, submitting, surrendering to the presence of the Holy Spirit, allowing Him to strengthen our lives, to grow in this particular area. That we what? That we could have a crown. It'll last for a lifetime. All Everybody's running, but not everybody's going to win. Make sure you win. Make sure you win. Every head bowed, no one looking around. You could be here this morning and maybe you've never made a decision concerning God's own Son. I believe people, when people are present in times like this, it's not an accident. I believe it's God's hand. I believe it's providence. You may be here and maybe never made a decision concerning the person of Christ. We'd like to give you an opportunity to do that. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. If you never accepted Christ, today's that day. Second of all, you may have wandered in your faith and say, Bill, I've, I, I, I've known the Lord. And I, I, I trust Him. But I'm just not where I should be. Then when we pray, would you pray also and just reaffirm that faith. Reaffirm that faith. Reaffirm your, the resolve in your life. Ask Him for that self-control that you might have need of, or that love. I like to pose the question, can you believe these things? Can you believe that Jesus Christ is God's own Son? Can you believe that He left heaven and came to earth? He was born of a woman, born of a virgin. If you say yes, and, and so many times people would, and I'd say, gosh, that's wonderful. But even believing those things doesn't necessarily make you uh, a, a Christian. I believe Muhammad lived, but I don't believe in Muhammad. I believe that Alexander the Great lived, but I don't believe in him. He's not my Lord. Do you believe he lived a sinless life? Do you believe he suffered for you? Do you believe he died on the cross for you? These are the things that begin to change us and transform us. Most importantly, do you believe he was buried and raised from the dead? If you can believe those things, then you are a candidate to be a child of God. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, we're giving you opportunity.
to do that this morning. Today's the day of salvation. He comes into our hearts by invitation. For as many that believe upon him, to them he gives the power, the right, the ability to become the sons of, of God. We're going to pray. We're going to invite everyone to pray with us. If you've wandered in your faith, again, pray with us. To know Him, to love Him, to serve Him. I'm not asking you just to accept Jesus as your Savior. More importantly, we're asking you to accept Him as the Lord of your life. The church world has made, has made salvation available without Lordship. We have fallen short. It doesn't say confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Savior. No. First you confess with your heart and believe in your heart the Lord. After Lordship comes salvation. We surrender to Him. I want you to give Him everything. I want you to say, Lord, take my sin. Take my hurt. Take my pains. My, my, my memories. But God, take, take what is in me that that can be used. Take my gifts, my abilities, my talents, my time. I want, you, I want you to be Lord of my life. I'm declaring it. You're in control. I'm surrendering to you. So we're going to give everybody an opportunity to confess and ask Christ to come into their lives. We'll ask everybody in the room to pray for us because the Bible says that we can pray one for another. And so we're going to pray together. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe that he lived. I believe that he died. I believe he died for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I believe your Lord. Confess my sin. I surrender all my life. Thank you, God, for sending my son. Again, I call him Lord. Jesus, you're my Lord. Thank you for saving me now. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. With every head bowed, no one looking around, if you're here this morning, say, that's me, Pastor Bill. When you prayed... I prayed also, you either didn't know the Lord, and you prayed. You've accepted Him. Or you, you've known Him, but you've wandered and you've reaffirmed your faith this morning. Just look up real quickly, no one else looking around. Give us just the briefest of time. Wait for our eyes to meet. We only want to know who we prayed with and for. Nothing, nothing will happen that will make you embarrassed. All right then. Thank you. Father, I thank you. You look down from heaven. The eyes of the Lord are upon us. Thank you, Father, for placing your eyes on our lives. Thank you for sending your Son. Thank you for sending Him to come after us, to win us, and to help us. Lord, I'm thankful that we're not going to neglect this great salvation that has been provided. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Listen, we're going to turn the service over to Leon, receive our tithe and offering given.